ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for your great interest in this topic. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all here, especially um, because I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm standing on the other side in general, um, but I'm not, I have to say. Um, I'm only working um, as a researcher. I'm doing research in the area of cybercrime, and um, I'm defending as well, so I'm on your side. Um, it's a little, still a little bit difficult for me to speak to you because you have um, all this technical knowledge that I don't have. So I can only give you some basic information. Um, some basic information that could be interesting for you the next two days or next three days you're here uh, because the question, is hacking a crime or not, if you're acting in Germany, uh, is quite an interesting question for you. I will get through um, a few details with you. I would like to talk to you about the situation in Germany as an example right now, and I would like to give you a view um, how the international development in this area is. So what is gonna, what are we expecting within the international harmonization in this area? If there are any questions from your side, um, just feel free to, to ask me any time. You can just simply interrupt me. There's a heavy light in front of me. I don't see very much, but uh, just stand up and say I have a question. Um, I'm not a technical expert, as I mentioned before, so if it really gets into technique, I'll try my best, but uh, maybe I will simply ask someone of you to give me a hand. Um, yeah, one more thing, that's the last thing as an introduction. I would um, like to, have this, to, 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 to get this done a little bit like um, a dialogue, not really a monologue. I'm not only here to give you some information, but take something home with me. Um, I will give you my email address at the end, because the terrible thing that is happening with regard to cybercrime right now is that there is quite a number of legislative activities, but um, people are doing that who do not really know the topic very much. So um, we have to get in some kind of dialogue with you and other experts, interest groups, um, to really solve these problems. I can't do it on my own, you can't do it on your own, but I would like you really to hear your point of view, hear your worries with regard to, um, to the legislation in this area. There will be an additional um, lecture this evening about data retention, what comes next. That would be very interesting for me to hear your point of view in this area as, as well. But let's get started with the question, is hacking a crime? Well, if you talk to people in the legislation who are in power right now, and I'm not going to mention any names, um, they still know hacking very well, or they seem to know hacking very well, because they always mention, oh, I watched a number of movies in the 80s, and I really know what hacking is about, and it's a difficult situation. De facto, there is not much going on in this area, not much legislation, and not much investigation from the police. They're concentrating on other crimes. For example, child pornography, or phishing. I mean, for me, phishing has quite a lot to do with hacking, but, but maybe not for you, but, but you know, this is what the investigation authorities are concentrating on. There is no, there are a number of small units that are investigating hacking, but hacking is happening on a large scale, especially the next three days here in Berlin. And uh, there are just a very, very few experts who would be able to prosecute you because they have the technical knowledge. But there was in the 80s really an intensive discussion about the question, shall we have criminal liability for hacking? And um, today, these discussions are very easy. If you're asking, shall we have criminal liability for dissemination of child pornography in the internet? There is not really discussion. That's, it's just done. We will have the law. And we have in other areas as well. But in the past, in the 80s, there was really an intensive discussion. And um, there must have been someone, some of you hackers uh, in the legislation because um, the government decided, no, it shouldn't really be a crime at that moment. We will get, I will uh, give you some more closer information about this in a minute. But um, at least there was a discussion. Today we don't have discussion anymore, so I would like to have some kind of discussion with you about this aspect. Well, in general, legislation with regard to cybercrime is difficult. There are people who really don't know the details, the technical details, they are just experts in the law area, and they're not especially in cybercrime, but in law in general, and they are drafting laws that are not really useful. I have uh, one example for you. Um, it's in German. It's, it's, it's just I've pasted it from one of the news boards. This is quite an, int quite an important interest group in, in Germany that mentioned at the beginning of this year that there should be a special regulation with regard to phishing. There should be some criminal provision in our penal law because it is not a crime yet. 
So what they basically wanted to have is something where they can prosecute phishing attacks. But that is absolutely useless because we have something like this in our penal law. It's just that these experts don't know it and that they don't know the technique. So therefore they don't know how to apply the law. And this is a, a situation I'm not too happy about. And if there's a chance for you, for the Chaos Computer Club or forever, to get influence in this area and really try to negotiate with these people and explain them where are the difficulties, what is the technique like, it might be possible for them to identify the provisions in the existing criminal law and apply them. So this was just a bad example for what is happening right now. There are a number of other examples that I will pick out a little later. Well, I don't want to say we don't need a criminal, we don't need uh, criminal provisions in the area of cybercrime. We definitely need them, that's no question. And I'm not here to say anything else. It's, it's very important. It is important because the internet offers a number of advantages for people who are willing to commit crimes. So therefore, we've seen a certain tendency that people are using the internet to commit crimes and we really have to deal with this. We have to ena enable the investigation authorities to deal with this problem. But we need to balance. It is impossible, or it should not be, that's my point of view, it should not be that we are prosecuting things in the internet that we will not prosecute in the real world. So there should be a balance between prosecution and criminal liability in the real world and prosecution and criminal liability in the internet. If you are exchanging pornographic writings, I mean real books, child pornography, in the real world, you will be prosecuted. If you exchange child pornography images in the internet, you will be prosecuted as well. That's pretty much the same. But right now we see certain tendencies that because the legislation, the government is feeling unable to handle the internet to get, get some kind of control mechanism to control it because it is technical, nearly impossible to control it. Because we see this development, um, we see that the legislation is trying to more and more regulate the internet. And this is a tendency which we should really watch very carefully and where we should try to keep in hand on and say, no, we shouldn't do that. This is a little bit too much. Hacking is something in between. Hacking can be a crime and, of course, a criminal act. If you're getting into a system, stealing data and selling them to somebody, that is definitely a crime. That's no question. And it, does everybody agree? Or was it a no? Okay. <laughs> I was not sure. Um, but, but, yes, please. Oh, well, wonderful. You, that's an absolutely perfect question. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so excuse that. Um, hacking. Yeah, there is a definition I'm, I will use in the future is access to your computer system. But, um, of course, there will be an argument for you why it can't be. It's, it's a little bit difficult. We, we have to meet at one point, technical point in your experience and my very poor experience and um, the legal basis. But hacking for me is, is access and, and, and so far illegal access and I cannot steal data. I can copy data. That's, that's for sure. But there's another question. Okay, so we are talking about crackers. Good. Okay, you're the hackers, you're the good guys, and the crackers are those who are. I, I will try to explain to you later on why it is very difficult to keep them out, so why it is difficult to divide between them. But um, mention it again if I um, talk about the, the bad hackers. Um, okay, so there is definitely a legislation needed in this area, but we have to keep a certain balance. Okay, let's start hacking in Germany. I mean, you're all acting in Germany. I don't know how many of you are Germans. How many of you come from other countries? If you're hack starting hacking attacks in Germany, you're under German law and you can, of course, be prosecuted. So it will be very interesting to hear what are you allowed and what are you not allowed to do. This is how I start, especially because it makes it easier to explain to you the international influence we'll see in a few minutes. Okay, German penal law is applicable uh, in Berlin and especially in this conference center. There was a, a news I read a year ago, I've never been to one of these conferences here before, but um, I read a news last year, end of last year, there was a report about this conference and it basically says something like, well, like in every year, um, hacking attacks were done, some, or cracking maybe we have to say, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but some um, pages were accessed and some information were changed, altered. So we were here or this page was hacked, just to show your ability. Um, it wasn't only one page or two page. This article said something like 18,000 pages changed 
within this three-day conference. So this was the news. And then they were quite surprised to hear that police read this and started investigation. Well, we'll see in a minute whether this is a crime or not, whether you're allowed to access a web page by circumventing any kind of protection and then changing data. This is hacking, would you say? This is hacking or is it cracking? Okay, good. Um, because that is, that is really the difficult field we are talking. We are not talking about these cases where it is absolutely certain that this is hacking if you're really getting access to the FBI computer and take off some, some information there. Um, this is something we don't have to talk about. We have to talk about this, what is happening here, these things you're just doing every day and you're doing for fun. Okay, um, hacking is, oh, well, no, it's a little bit difficult to say. Um, let us get through, um, through the, um, the procedure. When this law was drafted, and, well, 50 years ago, we we've had not had any, any regulation in the national penal law uh, dealing with hacking. In the 1980s, there was a discussion that we need something like this. And this was the, the first hacker movies were there, and they said, oh, we are very afraid of that, what could happen, so therefore we need a regulation. But the legislation was quite clever. They said, no, no, we do not, f for some reason, unlike other countries, they said in Germany, hacking should not be a criminal act. Accessing a computer should not be a criminal act. That should be, should be legal, not cannot be prosecuted under criminal law. But if you take data out, or if you delete something or change something, that should be a crime. So simply getting into it is no crime right now. It's a little bit difficult. Section 202A was implemented in the national law and it says, whoever without authorization obtains data for himself or another person can be prosecuted under German law. So they said, this is enough. Hacking should not be a criminal act. But, you know, the hacker, and especially the expert, said, well, if I'm hacking a system, if I'm getting into it, I would like to know, am I in or not? So I definitely want to see some kind of information. I want to see the first page or whatever. So if I'm in, there is some data sent to me, so then I obtain these data, so am I a criminal then or not? And um, the legislation was quite strict in this area. In the explanatory report, or the explanation about this law, they said, no, no, that should not be a criminal act. So the first information, the first page, these information, you obtain them definitely, but we have some kind of restrict interpretation of this provision which says if it is only the first page, it's fine. If you're obtaining the password, that's the first step. If you, if you for some reason, for example, social engineering, if you're getting in possession of a password, this is not 202A, definitely not. So this is all out. So it's, if you're really just entering a page, say, I did it, I'm fine, I leave now, that's it. That's no criminal act right now in most of the cases, in 99.9% .9 of the cases. The difficulty comes in the next step. The difficulty comes with these pages. If you say, yeah, I was here, or this change has been, this height has been changed, if you add something or delete something or whatever, because the alteration of data is definitely a crime under section 303A. If you're, whether you're entering, whether you're, whether you're circumventing any protection or not, if you're entering a page and changing data without authorization, you're definitely committing a crime. So therefore, this news was not very clever. I mean, I don't want to say you should do that or you should not do it, but if you do it, you should not really report about it. Let's get through it. We divide in, in our German national law between protected systems and unprotected systems. I mean, if I say protected system, password protected, you might simply laugh and say that's not protection. But that's about the kind of protection we are talking about. If there is an unprotected system, a system really that is open wide, there is no kind of access control on this side. Not even a very bad access control. You're allowed to access the system, that's for sure. For example, a web page without password protection. Of course, you're able and you're allowed to read them. You're as well as allowed to obtain data because the legislation, our law, does only say you're not allowed to obtain this information if they are well protected. So unprotected information are free information. That means if somebody says, I do not want anybody to read them and I want this to be protected by criminal law, he has to protect it. So unprotected information, you can obtain that, no problem but you're not allowed to, do, to alterate them. So even if there is no protection, you're not allowed to access a web page and simply change it 
unless the person said you were allowed to do so. Yes, please, there's a question. Yeah, I would say so. If you're not taking any so data, wrong, um, maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I have to say. Um, you mean you, if you're breaking into a wireless system, if you're breaking into um, a wireless network, which is password protected, if you're really not obtaining any information, um, just you. Using it, just yeah, we, we have a problem. We have. A, if there is any financial loss for the person, I mean, if it is a 24/7 network and if there is no no content or no um, if it is not limited to a certain number of of, of, of byte or megabyte that is can be downloaded, um, I see very little chances for someone to prosecute you under this. No, not under 202A. But it's a little bit difficult because as soon as as far as I know, as soon as you're hacking into the system, there are some information sent out. Um, so you have to get some, some information by technical means. That means if you're in, he needs to send you some, some information, you're sending him some information. But this is now the point where I really have to say I would like to get more into it, um, but I don't know the technical details. Um, there is Julius Mittentwart here, so if you would like to talk to him, I think he knows how to do it in practice. Um, so, so he knows much more about the practical scanning, and, and, and um, I can't help you with this one, but I think as long, no, not under 202A, I would say. If somebody's prosecuting you under 202A, give me a call and we have to discuss it again. <laughs> there is another question, please. Um, uh, one thing you had in the law section was um, it has not only to be a protection, but a well working protection. Okay, a special protection, yeah. Um, someone has a system with a password but he leaves the default password that everybody knows and is in everybody's documentation. Is the law intelligent enough to say, well, leaving the default password is not a protection? Yeah, the question was, it says specially protected against unauthorized success. So what is the special protection? There was really discussion going on about this issue. Do we really need a proper um, password? Do we need a proper protection general? Is a password, can a password be a proper protection? Well, the, the courts say something, some kind of protection which is not absolutely useless is a proper protection. So the question is really the detail. So um, if somebody um, in the source code, if he has the, the password in the source code, so if you simply have to access the source code and if he's really stupid and you can simply read it there, um, then I would say this is not a proper uh, this is not a proper protection, but a, a court could simply say, yeah, it is, because every kind that is not absolutely useless, you really have to know how to enter the source code. Well, it's not that difficult, but a, law, um, a judge might not be able to do that. So if he says, I'm feeling that it should be a proper, um, that is a proper protection, uh, then you have some difficulties. But uh, honestly, this was a long discussion going on, and I think you're right. There should be at least some protection. We have a similar problem with uh, the music industry protection of um, music and DVDs. We have a, a regulation in our National Penal Code that says circumventing these kind of protection, copy protection, um, is a criminal act. And uh, I was talking to one of uh, the guys from your site, and I've mentioned that to him while I was just uh, uh, getting together a publication, and he said, that's stupid, that's so stupid. What they call protection, copy, copy protection, is simply nothing. This is really a joke. And um, that is not a proper, this is not a proper protection. But um, the courts in general will say, well, if it is not absolutely useless, um, it's okay, it's a proper protection. So we, I think this is a very difficult situation, but we have to deal with this. So uh, be careful if there is any kind of protection. <laughs> okay, that was the unprotected system. The protected system is slightly different. Oh, there are a number more questions. Yes, please, let's start with the... I actually don't have a question, I just wanted to remind or ask you, but now remind everybody to use the mic because you don't get the questions on the videos and it's already hard to get them in the room here. Okay, sorry. Uh, I do have a question. Yes, please. Uh, what would be your opinion about information which is not protected by a password but which is simply hidden, for example, within a, a website, something I've been confronted to recently? Information which is not linked to from the main page, if you like, but you can quite easily guess its existence just by changing the web, web page that you're accessing. 
Would that qualify as proper protection or not? Mm. Mm. No, I have to, well, it's a little bit, it's a difficult question. I would like to think about it for a moment, but um, my first answer would be no, because that is no technical. This is a, a good protection, might be the best protection to, to hide information. Um, but I think um, I would, with regard to 202A, section 202A, I would really concentrate on technical protection. So I think this is, this would not be, no, this would not be a proper protection, my point of view. But um, yeah, I think there was another question from the back, but um, no, not now. I will just continue. You jump in as soon um, as you have another question. Okay, let's compare it with the real world. This is always important. I would, I would like, if you, if you have a discussion with a lawyer, um, always say that you would like to get everything compared with the real world, because if it is not a crime in the real world, it will be very difficult to argue why it should be a crime in the internet. If you are unlocking a door by technical means. I've, when I was up in the second floor, I saw two guys unlocking um, a lock. If you're doing that, if you're simply uh, going to a house, you're not passing a garden, which could be protected area, but you simply, from the street, you go to the front door and you unlock the door by some technical means. You don't open the door. You simply see, okay, now I could open it, but I leave it as it is and I'm going. It is no criminal act, my opinion. That's okay. As soon as you enter the room, you're committing a crime. Same if you're doing it in the internet. With a slight difference, the legislation, the current legislation says, if you're simply axing it for a minute, you do not want to obtain data, you just want to see, am I in or not? And then you're leaving again. This is not, cannot be prosecuted under 202A. And if you're taking something out of the house, it's quite sure this is a criminal act. But there is another question. Yes, please. When you say, when you say it's not a criminal act, I'm assuming you're talking just within Germany. But does that mean it's not a criminal act under this section or in general? Because if I go to a house in a bad neighborhood, and I unlock the door, which lets somebody else get in, at least in the United States, that's, that's no, a crime. No, no, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I mean, um, it's, it's a little bit difficult with the internet and a real house. If you're unlocking the door and leave it open, um, it's a complete different situation. If you're getting hacking into a, um, an internet page um, and you're leaving again, the protection still exists. So absolutely right. If you're unlocking the door and leave it open, you could be prosecuted as well. But I'm only talking about your criminal responsibility for the act you're doing at that moment. So it, there is no re legislation right now that says unlocking a door is a crime. But the difficulty will be if somebody catches you unlocking a door, he will say, what were you doing? And you were saying, no, I was only unlocking the door. I never wanted to enter the house. <laughs> Might be a little difficult. Might be difficult with regard to hacking as well. You know, if they catch you on the FBI webpage, first site, you've just hacked into it, and you say, I was just about to leave, um, <laughs> you might be in trouble. Um, and, well, same if you walk home to your hotel and unlock doors on the way. But just, but you're absolutely right. Okay, so that is the situation right now, but there is another question. Could someone please take the microphone to the front? Thanks. It's to the right. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I have some problems with your argumentation because, um, as far as I know, uh, analogies are not allowed in criminal uh, legislation in no, Germany. No, they're not. Uh, I think you have to turn it off. Yeah. No, this is a general principle, no analogy. This is very important, but only if it is, um, it, it is allowed if it is a profit for the accused, so you're allowed to do this. But I do not want to um, make an analogy um, with regard to the prosecution. I only would like to explain to you um, that the situation should be, should be similar. So if we're interpreting the law, and I would like to have a restrictive interpretation, I would like to say, if we are talking about cybercrime committed, we should really be very restrictive. If it is not a crime in the real world, we should not make it a crime in cyberspace. So therefore, this is allowed. This is this analogy, if you say stop a ban 
on criminal prevention is allowed. What is not allowed is to use a provision to prosecute somebody by using the analogy to widen it up. That is not allowed. To restrict it is okay. So, so therefore, I think we should really say, if it is not a crime in the real world, if you're only opening a door, if you're just simply unlocking it, and this is not a crime, it shouldn't be a crime if you enter a web page and unlock it. But that's just the current situation. I would like to jump to you uh, into some kind of international harmonization attempts in this area where we see quite a different point of view. We have two important harmonization instruments right now. First one is the Cybercrime Convention. And the second one is the framework decision about a text against information system. Um, the Cybercrime Convention is from 2001 and the framework decision is just from 2005. Two very interesting um, conventions or international harmonization attempts in your area. They're both dealing with hacking. So let us jump into the Cybercrime Convention. Just a few words to explain to you. It's from the Council of Europe. I'm, I'm working as an expert for the Council of Europe within this convention. I'm traveling around Europe trying to explain the convention to the member states, explain to them what they have to change, what they don't have to change. So Council of Europe is not the same uh, than the Council of the European Union. It's a completely different body. <coughs> Nothing to do with Europe. It's wider, more countries, more member states. And it's a little bit more difficult if you have a convention in this area. I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. Why is the Council of Europe working in this area? Well, he's basically concentrating on human rights, an aspect like, li like this. But uh, since 1989, they're concentrating on cybercrime as well because they've identified this is not a national problem. It's an international problem. We need harmonization. Right now, German investigation authorities are basically concentrating on cases in Germany. If you have some kind of international relation in some like that, if you start a hacking attack from the United States, well, investigation are very, very difficult because they're not used to it. They're really used to concentrate on their country. This has come some strange, this had led to some strange cases where somebody had a web page in Australia in English language and he came to Germany and he was prosecuted because they said, well, it's accessible from Germany. So we are, our law is applicable. So it's not that they're really only concentrating on their country, but this is, you know, criminal law is something that is really much related to borders and boundaries and to national countries and sovereignty of states. So therefore, it's very difficult to harmonize um, international cooperation in this area. But the Council of Europe said we need it. Um, we only know hacking cases at that time in 1989, but they said, still said we need some kind of harmonization and um, we have to put some pressure on it. And they started uh, with a report and then set up a commission that was drafting the Cybercrime Convention. And now comes a little difficulty. The first draft version, it was the 19th, was made public in 2000. And uh, a number of interest groups, among them the Chaos Computer Club, complained and said, excuse me, uh, why so late? Secret negotiation. Couldn't you have involved us a little bit earlier so we could have explained you some difficulties in your convention? Um, but we still can do it right now and they made a few suggestions and what the council of europe or special this expert group said was sorry it's so difficult to negotiate it we've agreed a certain level we, we come together on that point we cannot change it anymore so this is really difficult if i'm traveling around and i'm meeting with interest group they always say that was really stupid that was a very bad idea to negotiate it secretly without involving those people who have knowledge about it um, therefore, I would like to <laughs> discuss it with you right now. It's a little bit late, but um, still we have time to, to do it. Okay, since 2001 it was open for signature. Um, it contains a number of provisions. Substantive criminal law, for example, illegal access, child pornography, interference, all these things are into it. Only computer-related crimes, nothing else. As well, procedural law. And that we, we will not talk, be able to talk about this um, in detail, but um, you will like this convention when it comes to procedural law because it says no data retention, not at all. It says quick freeze procedure, that's the way we should go. And it says it's a viola it, it doesn't say it in words, but that's my interpretation. It says it's a violation of fundamental principles of human rights if we start a complete data retention of all information that are being done when you surf in the internet. So um, it is quite, it is, there are some harsh things in there, but on the other hand side, it has the idea of human rights and protection, so therefore it is less than what we do have right now. It's more trying to 
get intelligent investigation and instruments instead of simply saving everything that is happening around. Okay, it has um, provisions about the jurisdiction and very important international cooperation because there are very, very few international cooperation in this area right now. It will make your life much more difficult when this one is implemented because international cooperation will then be much quicker and will be more difficult to hide by using, um, for example, computer systems in other countries. Okay, that's just the basics. It's an international agreement and we have a difficulty with it. It needs to be implemented into national law. That means simply signing this convention does not force the state to implement it. You really have to implement the provision in your national law and that is very difficult. Germany signed it but it never implemented it yet. And there is no possibility, apart from political pressure, to make them implement it. So it's really something that is nearly impossible in, in an area that is developing so fast as the internet and computers, it takes ages really to involve it. If it is implemented in national law, I'm quite sure most of these provisions are already out. Okay, um, I tried to put up some, some information for you, some, some maps to explain to you the situation, um, but it's not working. It's a Microsoft, um, no, not a Microsoft operating system, sorry, Apple. Um, no, it's a Microsoft uh, program I'm using, and for some reason it damages my, my video files. But um, what I wanted to say was that in the beginning, the investigation authorities and still are only concentrating on a national level, but now they're realizing it's an international problem. If I'm sending a file to a friend in, in Australia, I might pass a number of countries. So we are really facing, it's really hardcore investigation that we are facing right now. Seconds, it only takes seconds or a quarter of a second for an information to pass a number of countries, but they are all, in all countries, their national law could be touched, could be triggered, because they say, well, it passed our country. So it's really hardcore investigation, a very difficult problem. We are not used to it. You know, if a car is stolen in Germany and taken to Poland, it takes hours for them to travel through Germany. So you have time. You can say, it was stolen at 10 o'clock, I have some time until it reached the border. Same with drug trafficking. But in the internet, it's so fast, we are, the investigation authorities are not able to deal with this right now. So they need a convention. We have, sorry, I'd like to go back. About 38 states signed the convention. I've um, prepared myself for a lecture about four months ago. This was the last time I was on the web page where all these ratification and signatures are mentioned. But right now, I think there are about 38 states that have signed it. These are the states, and you see it's not, well, it's not only Europe. What has South Africa to do with Europe? Well, the Council of Europe realized that Europe is not the spot of the world anymore. So if you want to fight cybercrime, you should maybe ask a number of other countries to join your convention, otherwise it would be useless. So um, they ask other countries, among them the United States, Canada, South Africa, Japan, uh, to join them as non-members, and they did this. They joined them within the negotiation. That made it terribly difficult to negotiate these aspects with them because they have, for example, the United States, a completely different opinion about free speech. So it was very difficult to involve them, but very important. But still, you see the black marks on the map, that's no man's land right now. There will be no harmonization in this area. So, I mean, every criminal who is really into that business will just simply move there or use servers to hide their identity that are based in those countries. So it's very difficult to explain these countries that they should ratify the convention because it is really, I don't want to say useless, it's good for the national states, but it's an effective fight against cybercrime will not be possible if all countries have ratified it. And here comes the next problem. Sorry, forget Albania and the number of countries have come, um, have joined and, or have ratified the convention yet. I was not able to update it. Uh, we have only 10 ratifications yet. And I would like um, you to see, no, the video is not working. There was a, a video zooming out now and uh, showing you that 10 ratification, this huge world is nothing. So right now there is no effective fight against cybercrime possible under the Cybercrime Convention. And Germany, United States and all those big countries have not ratified it yet. But still, it's an important step because it shows us the way we could go. And I would like to, um, to, speak, about you, um, to speak to you about this provision dealing with hacking. Before I say that, there were 
I've mentioned the criticism before, formal aspects were criticized, secret negotiations, and there was substantive criticism as well. They said, well, this um, real-time um, collection of traffic data or some of this, this is very difficult to handle. So some of these providers, especially the internet providers, said this is not a good regulation, but it's into the convention now and it's too late to negotiate about it right now. Okay, illegal access, that's the most important provision for you. Article 2, each party that has signed and has signed the convention shall adopt such legislation and other measures as may be necessary to establish a criminal offense under its domestic law, that was always just the introduction, when committed intentionally, the access to the whole or any part of a computer system without right. That is hacking. That is not only cracking, this is hacking as well. So this really sounds, if you only read that, this really sounds a complete ban on hacking. Let's get through it in, de in, in detail. I mentioned to you before we don't have a regulation like this in Germany right now because we are not protecting the integrity of a computer system. We're protecting data. You're not allowed to copy them. We're protecting data because you're not allowed to delete them or change them. But we are not protecting the integrity of a computer system, not known right now. But this provision does exactly protect that. Without right means if somebody orders you and pays you to test his computer system, to attack it, to see whether it's vulnerable or not, this is no problem. This is no criminal act. This was something a number of interest group complained. They said, well, this won't give us the chance to test our own systems anymore. It does. It's no criminal act if you have the permission to access the system. But in general, I think that's how I understand hacking, you don't have the permission. You try to do it, you do it for fun, or you explain to them and show them that their system is vulnerable. So this is a difficulty. If this provision is turned into national law, you have a certain difficulty. Okay, but it goes on. That's not all. It continues. And the Cybercrime Convention is nothing. There are not provisions that you can simply translate and put into national law. No, it gives you a lot of space for national interpretation, national adjustment. And the Cybercrime Convention, because a number of countries don't have something like uh, regulation and hacking right now, the Cybercrime Convention says a party may require the offense be committed by in bringing security measures, similar to the German regulation we have right now, that means only if it is protected, and if you're circumventing a protection, only then it can be a criminal act. So that's a possibility for the national states, or with the intent of obtaining computer data. Same in Germany right now. So Germany could simply keep its legislation, as it is right now, because the Cybercrime Convention does not force it to change its legislation, because it offers them a certain space for national adjustment. But the question is, will the national states limit Article 2 or not? Well, there are some good arguments because it's very easy. They don't have to change anything then. For, in Germany, other countries, it's different. But my opinion, that's with a number of discussion with experts, with people who are in charge of the legislation, a number of, not the entire parliament, I didn't talk to them in general, but, but a number of people in there who really have influence, they said, no, we won't. We are really gonna implement a regulation, Article 2, hardcore. That means no restriction, because it's so difficult to prove whether you've just entered the system or you've changed something there. Because as soon as you are in, you're able to hide everything you're doing. It's very difficult to find out what you actually did. As soon as you're the administrator of the page, you're doing things and we will never be able to find out. So therefore, if we can find out that you've accessed the system, that needs to be a criminal act, otherwise we won't have any chance to prosecute you. And why is that? Well, there's a great pressure, a great pressure from, um, from the industry that says, well, we would like to sue you. If one of you enters my system, I would like to sue you. That's the only way to, to stop you. Because, you know, the prosecutors, they're not able to prosecute them. They, they, they are really not not strong enough to do that. They simply say, no, I don't want to have that work. I don't understand the technical details. I just leave it out. But if we could sue you a million dollar, whatever, uh, that would be the right way. And they can't. They simply can't because they don't have the measures. So what they would like to be done is have this or have some kind of provision in the national law where they can force the prosecution to do the investigation. And then they can simply take the evidence that was collected and sue you. 
And the only chance to do that is you really need a criminal act. And right now there is no chance to sue you because as soon as somebody says, well, my page was hacked, I have the impression my page was, my page was hacked, but nothing was changed, uh, they, the prosecution simply says, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to start any proceedings based on that evidence because it's no crime yet. So the industry is very much interested in measures, in having criminal law measures in the national law. So that's the situation. And I think we will not have a regulation which is as restricted as it is right now. So if you want to do some hacking, do it right now. Do it before they implement the regulation in the national law. All right, um, next difficult provision. I just would like to mention it very briefly. Um, misuse of devices. That's really a difficult um, provision. It says that the parties should not only make hacking um, a crime, but as well as the production, sale, or even the possession of tools that can be used for hacking, these hacking tools, software that you need to hack a page. Why do they do that? They said, well, most of the software is so comfortable, so easy to use, even for someone like me who has no idea about hacking. If you install some, one of these software tools, I'm, I'm not talking about the the special tools you have, but there are some tools available in the internet that you can use for hacking activities. And they say, well, you know, it's, it's not only these very, very clever guys that are doing the hacking, um, there are even, you know, these kiddies that are, are doing hacking. And the number of people that are able to hack into system is increasing, so therefore we really have to stop that development. We um, have to put a ban on the software that is used. So it's not only the hacking, the act of hacking, the real crime, the criminal act, but they're really trying to criminalize an area before the crime was even committed. So this is a very, very difficult provision um, because I don't like, don't like this tendency to criminalize things that are happen happening before the crime was committed, but you, we will have to face this development. Yes, sir. So perhaps this goes back to the whole issue of not consulting people first, but Article 9 would make it a crime to to possess a computer program signed to, or a computer password or similar data by which the whole or any part of the computer system is capable of being accessed. I don't know how much people in Europe follow this, but Sony, BMG, Sony Music, United States, broadcast the entire computer. So similar access devices used for protecting digital content do the same thing. Would, would that be a huge reason that countries would not want to implement this law, is that the corporations are not going to be able to use such measures? I mean, how does that play into this? Okay, I would like, um, the, the difficulty with this provision was that a number of interest groups said, well, it's, we, we need software. We need the software, otherwise we're not able to test if our systems are working well. We really have to use all software. So if somebody who's using the software is able to access our system without really intensive knowledge. So therefore, there is a restriction in this provision, similar to Article 2, which says, well, um, if it is should not, this should not apply, this law of testing. It is mentioned there especially. If, if, if the software is used for, for reasons of testing and if the person has authority to do it, that's fine. So you use the software, you're able to produce the software uh, for testing reasons, but, you're not, but the difficulty is, will legislation say fail for or white market, for example, the internet or free download of the software in the internet is a crime or not? I mean, using the software, that's at least how I understand most of um, the people who are in charge of the legislation right now, they say, no, it's okay, you can use the software, the possession should not be a crime, um, but only for testing reasons. So if somebody finds your computer and there is a software installed and you say, well, it's only for testing my own web page, it will be very difficult to prove you a crime. But um, if you are, for example, selling the software without really finding out whether the people use it for hacking activities, illegal hacking, and hacking activities, or testing the system, um, that could be a crime. I don't like the tendency. I don't like, I think it is enough if we're fighting the crime. We do not have to fight things in advance, but uh, that's the tendency we see, and I think this is the most difficult part of the convention with regards to criminal law. And we'll have to wait for national legislation to international law to see um, how much it affects your work. But I agree with you. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether Sony does, well, this is the, the, the Sony password protection opening the system, but this is something that is under this regulation, but I'm, um, I'm not quite sure whether I understand you, understood you right, but uh, maybe this could be useful, it's not allowed to use anymore, because uh, it is something that is 
putting after that, we're putting in the disk. Uh, so that could really be the software under Article 9. So maybe some should be talking right now about this, but uh, that should be an Article Act. Act. Yeah. Okay. Um, these are the. This is the difficult situation. Um, hacking is not really the difficulty if the national law, the national legislation, respect the ability to restrict it in a way. If they don't, we are you are facing a problem. There is another thing, EU framework decision. This is a little bit more tricky because unlike, oh, there is another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read something similar um, and I'm unsure if, if it, it has been mixed up or if it is this convention, but the, uh, if, a, a proposal to do the same thing in uh, where you would be prosecutable across the nation boards uh, on copyright. And uh, I think the controversial part there was basically if you put something copyrighted up on the net, you will be prosecuted. You just expect a juridical person or the corporation could take you uh, and file you for violation of copyright in, in Bahamas or wherever it's suited to the corporation. Uh, and I think this was connected to this convention from what I've heard, what I've read, but, you know, I don't no, know. No, I'm not quite sure, no. Right. At least I didn't read it. Right. No, it, it was a book by Drehos, I think, he, the author was called. But no. All right. I'll check that then. All right, then. Um, there is this framework decision. 2005, it's just come up. I don't know if you realize that. Um, it's a little bit more tricky because um, the EU can force the countries to implement it, and they will force them to implement it until 2007. So there could be that the Cybercrime Convention is not implemented in 2007, but this framework decision will be implemented. It's not as far as broad as the Cybercrime Convention because it is, has only provisions with regard to substantive criminal law, no criminal procedure law, no international um, harmonization with regard to investigations. So it's only procedural law. And therefore, um, it will be implemented until the beginning of 2007. That's definitely sure. Article 2, same article, dealing with hacking as well. Each member state shall take the necessary measures to ensure that the intentional access without right to the whole or any part of an information system is punishable as a criminal of offense at least for cases which are not minor. So this is a very, um, it's a very similar offense if you compare it to the Cybercrime Convention and it looks like a complete ban on hacking as well. There is a question in the back. Um, just a comment. Um, as far as I know, um, there's a, oh, I actually read it, um, a communication from the European Commission um, because of the uh, court ruling of the European Court of Justice. So um, the whole European criminal law framework is invalidated by this, um, by this new court ruling and has to be reintroduced um, into Parliament as a directive um, under different procedural rules. And this also applies to the so-called uh, second IPR enforcement directive. Um, so um, this... Um, this framework decision will be pushed through um, in the next year through Parliament, but it's not, uh, but it's not law yet. Um. I've, I've, I follow this discussion, um, but only with regard to the copyright aspect. As far as I know, this one was not concerned, but I'm not quite sure. Um, if it is, um, I just didn't get the information. Um. Uh, it was mentioned in the annex um, of the document, uh, among other uh, criminal law uh, procedures. Uh, and um, actually, the whole European criminal law framework is, is a real mess. And there's a lot of resistance from member states, especially as criminal law in the European Union is not really harmonized because law is so different, especially uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, they have a more kind of case law tradition and don't like to implement criminal law. And this whole criminal law framework came up, I think, in 2001 or 2002 with uh, the protection against illegal copying of currencies uh, of the euro. Uh, and then they tried to get into other areas of criminal law, but, um, well, actually, you can do something. Uh, you can stop this. Uh, 
provision um, or, or change it um, because it will be reintroduced in, in, in the next year. Yeah, but I mean, we, we saw the um, European Parliament um, with regard to data retention, and that did not really solve the problem. I mean, that was, uh, it, they could have stopped it, but they didn't do it. So um, I'm not too optimistic that they will stop it, but so thank you very much for the comment. It's, uh, it's, you're, you're very much right because um, criminal law was basically not under your, um, um, was not something the EU was dealing with. It was always member states. And they took out some of these things, for example, with regard to cybercrime. They have the possibility for legislation in this area. Uh, but we'll see whether the European Parliament will change something. Right now, there is an Article 2 a provision that could mean a complete ban on um, hacking. There is one exception because it is limited or can be limited, um, no minor cases. So if you're really just hacking into a small K, into a small web page and not the FBI web page and not my web page, um, no, no, if it is uh, just a small one, um, then there is, will be no criminal liability for that. But it uh, has an amendment as well. You can restrict that, but not as far as you could under the Cybercrime Convention. Um, so each member state may decide that the conduct referred to paragraph one is incriminated only when the offense is committed by infringing security measures. That means only protected sides are protected by the criminal law. So, well, the difficulty if, is if it is not protected, how can that be hacking? I mean, you know, if there is a web page, an open web page I'm accessing, it can't be a criminal act. So I think there will be the need to uh, implement something like this. Without this, it is a very, very wide criminalization. Well, that's, um, there is another question, but that would be it for, from me um, right now. Oh, sorry. Um, that would be it for me right now, but there is another question. Yes, please. Just a moment. Okay. I see a big problem with um, using uh, wireless networks as well in this article because uh, when you use a wireless network you don't know if you're allowed to use it or not you cannot ask the owner but this is this is the fact i mean um, i was uh, talking we were talking about misuse of um of um wireless networks and somebody said well i'm not hacking into them i'm just driving through the street and my computer simply logging on this wouldn't be a criminal act but you're absolutely right if they do not restrict the provision that could really be difficult by someone just saying no no one should use my open network and you're simply driving through the street and accessing it so i think th this would really be a very very difficult situation if they would be if the prosecution would be allowed to prosecute you driving through the street and logging into it so i think war driving in general is not a crime yet, and that is the conclusion we do have in, in Germany. So there were some investigations going on. I mean, if you have these huge antenna, if, if you have them on, on your car, uh, police stopped them to stop these guys and said, come on, you, you, you're just committing a crime. Well, in general, it's not. So if you're driving through the street and just checking if are there open networks or not, um, this is not a criminal act. The question is only, will they believe that you were just driving around um, or doing something else maybe, hiding your identity. Well, if you have any remarks, if you have any questions, or if there is anything that, that you realize uh, in the real world that might be a problem and should be discussed, um, just send me an email um, and I will try to answer as well. And if you would like to have this presentation um, as a PDF document, um, just send me an email as well and um, I will send it to you. Okay, yeah, that's, um, if there is no, oh yeah, there is another question, yes please. Uh, I just wanted to, to comment on the analogy uh, with the real world. Um, maybe the, the fact that simply unlocking a door uh, is not forbidden is that's because nobody does it. Um, I think, obviously uh, it, it's if, uh, but uh, if people uh, would start doing it uh, on a wide scale, it would get uh, outlawed because it annoys the owner to, to no end. Uh, and, a society uh, would tell the, the, the lock pickers, go, go, go pick your, your, your own locks. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the situation could change if, you're, if uh, all of you run out in the streets now and unlock um, doors. That's, that's for sure. And it's, um, I think it is the same situation with hacking. I mean, uh, I don't know how many of you simply hack a page, get into it, and then they say, that's it, that was fine, that was all I wanted to do. Um, I think this is more or less a theoretical problem. But if we discuss it on a legal basis, we have to... Um, 
take cases out that are more or less theoretically because that's the only thing we can deal with. If it is a mixture, it's always more difficult. You know, if you say he was there but he didn't really take any data, he didn't delete it, he just changed the name and not the data itself. And, and you know, if, if, if these are the cases how they happen in the real world, um, but it will be much, would be much more difficult to discuss them with you. So I just picked out really cases that are easy to handle. But there is another question here. I was asked to give you at least five minutes time uh, to go to the next lecture. So I simply say we should just continue our discussion. So if anybody for you is running, is on the rush to the next uh, conference, please feel free just to leave. Yes, please. Um, all these cases you presented were pretty much black and white. You either have access or not. What will happen if I have limited access to a website like I'm a customer and I'm allowed to view my data? and I'm looking for some data that is supposed to be there, but it's not there, so I'm looking around, there's page one and four, maybe there's two and three also, and that way I found data I'm not supposed to find, or they claim I'm looking to hack the system to manipulate something which I'm not, or I'm only trying to find something. Um, is any legislation um, about a scenario like that? Um, well, I would say you're in trouble then, but um, it's, it, there, was a, there was a case, a very similar case. There was a computer company that was running a server system and they, it was protected by a wonderful big door. And um, they said, okay, we protect the door, but there was somebody came in the room to clean and he was allowed to clean the room and he simply accessed the computer system. So the question was, was this a violation of section 202A because he had the limited right to get into the room um, and this was the only protection for the computer system. So therefore, um, it is a good question. In general, it is not protected if you have access, and it can only be prosecuted or cannot be prosecuted. But you can only you could be sued by um, your boss if you are getting into the data. I think there is a next lecture going on in about two minutes, so I ha we have to stop it here because my colleague um, will blame me if um, I'm not going to stop right now. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. There will be an additional lecture on. Uh, the legal issues um, at six o'clock about data retention, not data retention, the, ne the question what comes next after data retention because uh, they're already planning the next steps. Thank you very much for your attention.